Hey, this is Jimmy Golden, and you're listening live and in color to Wolfie D. Hey, this is Jimmy Street, host of the Live and in Color with Wolfie D podcast. Hear the life and times of professional wrestler Wolfie D. From his time in the territories with PG-13 to his time in WWE, ECW, WCW, TNA, and more. Nothing is off limits, and nothing will be held back. Thanks again for tuning in. Here he is, Wolfie D. Welcome, welcome, welcome once again to Live and in Color with Wolfie D and my man Jimmy across the street. Jimmy. What's up? You watch WrestleMania? I did, man. What about you? I did. It's a current affair. Yeah. Uh, Man, breath of fresh air is all I can say. Yeah. Uh, Both nights. uh, I felt like there's, there's, there's a, you know, obviously... Hunter comes out on night one and, you know, it's a new era and all that. I really kind of felt that through the, through the thing, man, it was like, it was old school, you know? And and I know some people were probably knocking that first main event night one, but that was old school, man. That was old school. They, you know, they, they, they did the deal where, Hey, if you, you know, you're fired if you count. And so then it was pretty much, you know, they had to, the referee couldn't do anything. I kind of like that. I kind of didn't. I almost feel like if they'd have done it behind his back, it would have been more heat, but I, I mm-hmm. get it. Uh, you know, you can second guess all day long, but it was good. And, um, yeah, I loved it, man. It, they went, they put in time, uh, you know, some heat selling, you know, there's a lot of selling the Gunther match. Oh uh, man. And I may get confused on what matches were what nights, but the Gunther and Sammy, uh, and I was kind of like, I'm not, because uh, let me uh, just say this for the listeners. I, I don't watch Raw. I don't watch SmackDown. Uh, I'll watch a pay-per-view every now and then. Okay. Right. So that's where we're at for me. Right. Uh, yeah. And I'm not sold on Sammy. I think he's a good wrestler. I just, you know, I'm just not sold on him. I'm really not sold on Cody to be quite honest about it uh, as a world's champion, but man, everything they did meant something and it led to something. And it was great uh, in-ring storytelling a lot on a lot of the matches. Uh, you know, there was one that I didn't care for too much and, the same one that everybody else didn't care for and for me it was just god the the, the, i think that could have been done differently with the super kicks and it might not have been as bad if it hadn't have been so many slaps so many slaps on the leg i mean it's just like hey we are slapping our legs and we're gonna keep doing it for a while yeah (laughs) It, I think it, it, it killed the illusion, man. I, I understand what they were trying to do, you know, beating the hell out of it. It was almost like exchanging punches except exchanging super kicks, which a kick <laughs> is usually supposed to do. Mo- if you're a good striker, your kicks, because your legs are stronger, should be, you know, more powerful than your punch. But right. I don't know, man. I just – I uh, and a lot of people, I guess, couldn't get into that. I don't – I don't know, man. I hate to knock it because the Rikishi's kids and I love Rikishi to death, you know, and, um, yeah, man, it's, I, I thought WrestleMania overall was really good stuff, man. Whatever, whatever got changed with Vince leaving or whatever the deal is, it's working. You know? Yeah. There's stories being told. Yeah. It's, it's hot, but not hot shot. You know what I mean? Right. They're, yeah. they're, they're telling great stories. I mean, and, and you're right. The Usos match, I tell you what, man, I think I figured it out. I think I just prefer them as a tag team. I, I well, do. I mean, you know, you know, I mean, you've talked about it. I, I think that with uh, Jamie and I, when they split us up, it just didn't work. It just didn't right. work. So I kind right. of feel for them. Yeah. But at the same time, they put the match together. Uh, I don't know. I, I, like I said, I know what they were trying to get at, but it just didn't work. Um, and yeah. I think like I said, the slaps had a lot to do with that, in my opinion. Yeah. Because, um, yeah. You know, and Bobby I think, Eaton started that yeah. slapping stuff you know, <laughs> with the left arm. And dude, it was out of nowhere. He did it that one time. And, you know, and then everybody caught on to it. Not on to him, but after everybody started doing the slap punches, you can't do it every time. Right. And I ain't going to say I ain't slapped my thigh on a, on a football kick to the stomach or something, but right. I don't do it every time, man. You right. got you can't just keep doing that. I, I don't I don't agree with that. But the, the Ray of Ripley and uh, Becky Lynch, I've seen that knocked a little bit. But on my in my opinion, that's one of the better matches, uh, one of the best matches of night one. Um 
uh, th- you know, Becky was has apparently been sick. I mean, I, I really couldn't tell. I don't know. I thought people were like, oh, she didn't put on a good performance. I thought they had a really good match. So, right. overall, I think WWE is is rolling in the best direction they've rolled in a, in a long time. And, you know, it also shows you, man, with the, the end of the main event on night two, old school still around, baby. People yeah. like it, man. People they like do. it. Yeah. And I mean, dude, they just, you know, some people complained that it wasn't Stone Cold. It was The Undertaker. But, you know, I maybe just Stone Cold said no. Maybe he just wasn't going to be in the area. And, uh, you know, Taker's going to be there. And also, I was thinking of it from this perspective. You know, Stone Cold and The Rock are a little more evenly matched. You know, I could see Taker coming in cold, totally, you know, totally no build up whatsoever and they believe that he could just choke slam the rock and get him out of there the one funny thing that i noticed several people do and like whether it was the rock bottom to the rock or mm-hmm. just how different the size of these new guys are compared to guys like the rock you know what i mean yeah, yeah. and it like it felt like I, cody did that one rock bottom on the tables from the other mm-hmm. tables and it just felt like man you could tell the rock's a heavy boy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and then you know so uh, you know undertaker's always got that little pant jerk he does to help get him up you know but yeah. you know it, it was good. And, and, you know, I think just like I've heard you say so many times before to, to build up that night, that shining night, you have to have the biggest, baddest, meanest, ugliest fire breathing dragon, dragon out there. Yeah. And, and that that's what they did. And, and is Cody going to go down in history as the greatest of all time as champion? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe so. Yeah. But when it comes down to it, it was what the story needed. And it just makes me feel like, you know, so many people were saying, you know, I don't know if, if that should have happened. I, I don't know if the, the, you know, I think the Roman should, Roman should have kept it. I just yeah. think it was time to pay that story off, you know? Yeah. And it, they've been begging for it. And then you got people going, Oh no, <laughs> people are going to bitch, man. And it's just right. my thing. If you, if you like wrestling, you like that. If you, just watch wrestling to critique it. You've never been out there or you've never been out of your state or whatever. Right. You sit down, <laughs> <laughs> sit down, Don't watch it or do something, man. But I yeah. thought it was really good. Really, yeah. really good. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, what, what rating would you give it while we're about to wrap up talking about WrestleMania? What rating would you give okay, it? Okay. Well, I'm not Dave Meltzer, so I will just say that it was damn good. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I rated. I was, damn good. Yeah. I was going to say like B plus A, you know, yeah, something still, like that. Man. I mean, it's hard to, you know, right. there's so many different matches. And so overall it was damn good is what I give it, man. It was, it was cool. It, <laughs> I, I really liked, uh, and I called it. Uh, I didn't call it beforehand, but I see Ray coming down looking like the Philadelphia Eagles, you know, and I thought oh, that's mm-hmm. cool. That's very cool. He always yeah. does something sort of like that. But as soon as those dudes jumped the rail, I was sitting here with Isaiah. As soon as those dudes jumped the rail, I was like, that's two of the Eagles. He goes, how do you know? I said, well, that was Jason Kelsey. <laughs> I just, knew it. I just knew it. <laughs> <laughs> it's either, it's either the Eagles or demolition just jumped. In. <laughs> yeah. Cause those are some hosses, man. Yeah, man. And I hey, just people don't tell, understand, you know, man, how big yeah. the NFL linemen are, man. And I do, cause you yeah. know, my Titan story with TNA. Right. I don't know the boys are yeah so. exactly and of course our buddy dennis kelly you've stood beside him before yeah, yeah. looked up at him last big week. big that man was the weather was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was a cool touch for the home team you know that was cool yeah, absolutely so. i love stuff like that man yeah you, and- it, it really, the and just knowing where his roots were from, as far as the rocks work and everything, and, and I'm sure he was kind of the producer on that match. I would guarantee that almost. Sure. Not, and he didn't have help, you know, with Michael Hayes or something like that. But that was a lot of Memphis in that match, man. There was, man, very much. Yeah, I saw the, that. I've heard people say that too. The break it down. The let's, you know, I can hear myself saying, okay, we'll start out, you know, little little bullshit in the ring, and then let's let's just get wild. Let's go out in the crowd. Let's fight. And then we'll settle it down and bring it back in. Yeah, I don't know how right. many times I've said that. <laughs> uh, and and that's what they did, man. They did that, and then started being heels. Yeah. Be in heels, man. And uh, I enjoyed it, man. I enjoyed yeah. It. 
and everybody knew that they had to win the night before because Cody had to vanquish the ultimate everything, you know, <laughs> bloodline rules, throw everything you can at him. I even thought maybe some more. I know they've signed Rikishi's other son, Jacob Fatu, and, and Tamatonga, which is uh, Haku's son. I know mm-hmm. they've signed them, and a lot of people were expecting them to maybe do a run in to ex- you know add more to the bloodline. But I don't know where the bloodline storyline goes. I mean, there's certainly ways to make it continue and there's ways to kill it entirely you know and but at this point like you know we're we're a week behind the way we do our show uh, right but it'll probably be spelled out by the time we're talking about this or not spelled out but at least start in a different direction um or of course on however they're going to do it but yeah man overall damn good and you know usually we don't talk about current stuff but i'm i'm sold on the product right now i'm yeah i'm, I'm down yeah. I'm, I, it's in a good spot for sure, and I'm happy. It is, man. Yeah. It's a breath yeah. of fresh air. Absolutely. So, yeah. cool, man. So, there's our current affairs for you uh, folks that have been wanting us to talk about current affairs. So, <laughs> there it yeah. is. It's a current affair. And That's if you want more, let us here. know, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. If you want yeah. anything, let us know. We're, we're, we're open to ideas and questions and uh, all that. So, yeah. uh, today... We got Bunkhouse Buck, Jimmy Golden. Yeah, uh, that's this should be cool, man. I talked to him on the phone a couple of weeks ago, and you know we've met once or twice, uh, and, and and you know not very briefly, very briefly. So we had a great conversation. Super nice guy, um, and I know he's gonna have some hella stories to tell us. I mean, he's got decades in this business, so this ought to yeah. be really cool, man. And and you know we've talked about WrestleMania. You got anything to add on WrestleMania or? Or anything else you want to talk about real quick? Maybe Kayfabe Cave? Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to do. You know, leading into that, of course, the reason we have Jimmy Golden is our buddy Todd Camp and Kayfabe Cave. Of course, Jimmy's going to be doing a signing this Saturday, April 20th at the Kayfabe Cave in Pulaski, Tennessee from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. If you're not in the area, I think there's even a, a virtual opportunity after the signing is over. They're going to do a, you know, Captain's Corner style, you know, deal. So so make sure you follow the Kayfabe Cave on all your favorite social media platforms, and I'm sure you'll see that Todd and them are doing some cool things in that store. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy for them and happy that we're working together with them. You know, it's very cool. Perfect. So make sure you see that. But other than that, I've got nothing. Let's just talk to Jimmy Golden, man. Let's get him on the phone. All right. We'll be right back after these messages. Hey, folks, to get your official Live and in Color with Wolfie D merchandise, go to ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash Live Wolfie D. Check it out. If you're listening to Live and in Color with Wolfie D on Apple Podcast and like what you're hearing, Go ahead and leave a five-star rating. And while you're at it, write a review. Tell us what you liked. Tell us what you'd like to hear in the future. It's very important to us and always appreciated. Thanks again. Welcome back. If you survived the commercials, you are still listening to us, and we appreciate that because we have got another special guest today, and I'm going to bring him up now. Folks, I got to say, this is going to be a confusion for me and hopefully not for you, too. So Jimmy Street across the screen today <laughs> is going to be, hey, you big dummy, because I got Jimmy Golden on here, and I'm not going to be going, hey, Jimmy, and they both go, huh, me, what? So we're going to be, it's going to be Wolfie, big dummy, and my man, Jimmy Golden, Bunkhouse Buck. What's going on? Well, I'm sitting here watching it rain. Yeah, in Maryville, Tennessee, uh, not a whole lot of happening uh, today, but, but today. your podcast, man, we've been waiting on you. Oh, wow. yeah, man. And, awesome. and we want to go ahead and give a big shout out to our to our guy, Todd Camp, uh, from Pulaski's Tennessee, the Kayfabe Cave, because that's where you're going to be on April the 20th. At, at what time is that? 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. Okay. And that's All 110 right. South 1st Street, Pulaski, Tennessee, the Kayfabe Cave, your preeminent source of all things collectible. <laughs> Very cool. Sounds like you got it down, big dummy. 
<laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. So, Tony, I, love- I used to live in Maryville, Tennessee. And it sounds like you live there, and now Ricky the Dragon Steamboat lives there. I done moved away. Uh, but, dang, I'm going to move back. Just come hang out, y'all. Yeah, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a great time, man. <laughs> It's so how is, how is life country. after wrestling? How's life after wrestling? Well, it, it's okay. Uh, I do miss it, you know, uh, but it's, that's a young man's game, and right. I'm not young anymore. Uh, <laughs> so, but yeah, you know, I had, shoot, almost 50 years of the wrestling business yeah. and getting in the ring, and heck, that ought to be enough for anybody. Yeah, you you was in there a while, man. Was it something that, I mean, you were just, obviously the family ties there. I mean, you were almost, you had to be in the business. But was was there any part of you that was a fan at first? Or was it just, this is the family business and all my cousins are in it. And then so this is what I'm going to do? Well, yeah, both. Uh, It it was a family affair. And I was a fan also when I was a kid. Okay, You know, I'd been going to. Memphis wrestling way back when they used to have it at the LS Order Tour mm-hmm. with my with, uh, my grandfather Roy Welch. You remember him? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. And then we watched, you know, watched a lot of the old time greats. And of course, I had a lot of family members that I admired a whole lot, had a lot of respect for. It was, was Roy and Herb and Jack and Lester. And then you had the Hatfield boys, Lee, Don, and Luke. Um, mm-hmm. Hatfield, they were all really good in the ring. Of course, I'm a bit partial, mm-hmm. but uh, you know, there was a lot of lot of good talent come through Memphis over the years. Oh yeah. So well, I was a fan, man. I I loved it, and then and then of course I I got my chance to get in the ring too, and and I I loved it also at, uh, taking the bumps and getting the hell knocked out of me. There's something strange <laughs> about a man who likes to get the hell knocked out of me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's think? not a. Yeah, that's not a guy you mess with. <laughs> now, pre wrestling, pre wrestling, were were you an athlete in school? Yes, uh, baseball, basketball. Didn't have a football team. I I lived with uh, Roy Welch on his farm for several years when when I was a young man. And uh, but yeah, baseball, basketball was my my two favorites. Yeah. You, now at your at your size, you had to be a pitcher, weren't you? I'm mostly first base, or I played anywhere. I didn't care. You just, yeah. you just give me a spot. Yeah, I got, I got you. Yeah. So um, you talk about Memphis and everything. So I, I wouldn't have thought that Memphis would have been what you grew up on. I would have thought more, you know, continental area. So did you? You lived in Memphis or around Memphis as a kid? Well, Roy, Roy, I was born in Dyersburg. Oh, Tennessee. Okay. okay. Robert and Ronald Fuller, they were born there also. And yeah. Roy had a farm in Yorkville, Tennessee, a little bitty farming town. Mm-hmm. They're right outside of Dyersburg a little ways. Uh, mm-hmm. so, but, you know, we, we'd go to Memphis on Monday nights a lot. And, uh, and you know, and there was a few times that uh, uh, Buddy Fuller, which was an uncle, he had territory in Memphis there early on. And then he also had a territory in Mobile. Mm -hmm. I saw matches down there. And then my dad promoted in Florence, Alabama for for the uh, Goulas and Welch territory. You know, just all kind of places around Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee. You know, I've seen matches in all those places. Memphis was the main hub for me, though, because I was living on the farm with Roy. And I'd go with him. Yeah, right. Yeah. It was later on that you actually uh, worked in Memphis, but I mean, since most of my listeners, a big majority of my listeners are, uh, you know, Jarrett Territory fans, Memphis fans, that type of thing. Um, So let's jump into that and just talk about some of the people. Let's say, you know, you talked about some of the older uh, guys that you were talking about that influenced you and wanted to make you do it. But let's talk about some of the ones you wrestled with and then then just some of the guys that are just Memphis legends. I mean, thoughts on Jerry Lawler, or Bill Dunn, those types of people, man. Give me some of your memories on that. Let's, let's talk about Jerry Lawler for a minute. All right. Yeah. Well, we, we we went. Me and my dad left Louisiana and opened up a territory in Montgomery, Alabama, mm-hmm. land Montgomery, Gaston, Tuscaloosa, and Nick Gulas would send us talent 
Right. And Nick, every once in a while, he called. He'd have some guys he's going to let go, and they were looking for a place to go. He called one day and he said, "Well, I got this guy and I got that and I got this young boy named Jerry Lawler. He's mm -hmm. he's needing a place to go. He he's just starting." So Daddy said, "Yeah, send me this one and that one, and send me that young boy Lawler mm -hmm. down here." So he came down and he started wrestling for my dad, and and uh, we watched him wrestle about a week or so, and we we both started seeing dollar signs. Really? <laughs> so this, this boy, you know, there's there's some people that is just born to be a natural athlete, be natural at maybe baseball or wrestling. Yeah. Whatever it may be, mm -hmm. Lawler was born to be a wrestler, yeah, a professional wrestler, and he was outstanding. And we had he was in the he wasn't there a month, but we had him on top in the main event. Wow! And so from there, he stayed with us down there in Montgomery, probably a year, a little more, maybe a year and a half, something like that. And and he he decided to go back home. And when mm -hmm. he went back home to Memphis. You know what happened from there. Yeah. <laughs> same thing, baby. He, went, he exploded. Yeah. He yeah. went straight to the top, and Jerry Lawler was the king. So we had several guys that come through that had a lot of talent. Jerry was one of them. Yeah. Yeah. And the uh, split and, you know, happened. Do you say he got sent over there? And, and, and the split happened before, I mean, after that, obviously, when he went back home is when the split happened, right? What, what you what do you mean the split? When, when Goulas and Jarrett uh, split the territory or whatever that was. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and they kind of split off, I guess. Uh, uh, long story. Uh, Jarrett Jarrett was a uh, his mama worked in the office. Right, Tini. Christine and Jerry sort of worked in it around the office, and he had a lot of good ideas. Mm -hmm. Grandpa Roy recognized that, mm -hmm. and then he became a wrestler also, and, and, a, and a pretty doggone good one. Mm -hmm. uh, so did his son. Yeah. Uh, and then, then Grandpa Roy died, and when he died, that's when things split up. Gotcha. Jerry, Jerry was in control. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then Nick, you know, Nick finally got old and retired, and and uh, well, his in which was mostly Birmingham, right? Had right. Two, two major towns on Monday night: Birmingham yeah. and Memphis. <laughs> and you had you had a big enough territory there that had two crew of guys That's that could work. You know, they supported a lot of wrestlers. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, but the split happened there, and uh, Buddy Fuller, my uncle, uh, he so his name is Edward Welch. Mm -hmm. And he came by the ring name Buddy Fuller. Mm -hmm. So he was taking up him and my mother, uh, Roy Welch's part, and trying to do business with Jared. And mm -hmm. that worked out okay for a while. And then it finally it ended up that Buddy sold out to Jared. And uh, Jared ended up with the whole thing. Why do people uh, give me your version of this? Because I've kind of heard uh, some people say like, oh, Jarrett stole the territory. And then I hear other people say different things. What does your take on that? Well, you might say it happened that way. Jarrett stole the territory and, and maybe not. You know, he kind of worked his way into it. Gotcha. He had, he had control, him and his mama, of the, of the towns, the TV, and uh, so, you know, I, I don't know. I don't want to say so. Uh, I had mixed feelings about that, Whoopi. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so, but like I said, I don't want to say he stole it, uh, but he ended up with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and listen, I, I have nothing bad to say about Jerry or Jeff. Uh, they both were uh, great to me, and uh, if it wasn't for them, I may not have ever gotten a break in the wrestling business. So I, that's that's not to not Jerry Jarrett at all. I just know what a businessman he is, and 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 what a businessman Jeff is. And and like I said, I I hear people say you know he stole it, but in, in my mind, and what I know of both of them is just they they out businessed you, out coached them, or something. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah, he he was he was in position to keep it. Right. 
to keep yeah. to keep it and and uh, you know they I'm sure that Buddy had maybe thought about running opposition to him and I don't know you know I, I, I was just one of the boys right right and that's basically all I ever wanted to be I just wanted to be one of the boys yeah I didn't want to get really mixed up in all the promotion end of it. Because it can be a cutthroat son of a gun. Huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We know that. Uh, so, like I said, another Memphis person that I have close ties with that I mentioned, Bill Dundee. Obviously, my partner was his son. Um, and then I go way back with Bill. And then I get, you had relations uh, with uh, Jim Barnett, who uh, had a lot to do with Bill, I think, coming over and all that. Uh, talk about Bill and, and Jim Barnett. You know, uh, in 1972, Buddy Fuller uh, and Eddie Graham bought half the territory uh, in Australia. Uh And they they asked me to go uh, to be one of the boys. Uh, I went and stayed two months, and that's when I first really met Jim Barnett. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm sure I guess Dundee and George Barnes, they were there at the time. I don't really remember them. But there was a lot of guys, the Australian boys. And then the next thing I knew, they were in Tennessee working. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I had a great time in Australia. I was supposed to go back. I ran into some problems and didn't get to go back. And that was, uh, nah, that hurt. Yeah. Because I, I sort of let down my, my family uncle there, Buddy Fuller. Uh, they put me over like a million dollars and I was supposed to go back and I couldn't go back. And, mm. So that ended up, I think they ran it for like a, a year or so after that and ended up selling it to somebody else. Gotcha. Somebody else went in there and started running it. Dundee, Bill Dundee and George Barnes, they made a great time. There was another boy. Uh, there was three of them. Mm-hmm. I can't remember the other kid's name right now, but he they were great. They were good. They got over like a million dollars in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, right now I'm going to do a rolling hot tag over to Big Dummy and uh, you come on in. <laughs> We're doubling down on that, aren't we? All right. <laughs> <laughs> so so here's here's one of those things that, that you know, I, I've got to yeah. ask you about because a lot of people may think this is actually a fictitious town. OK, but anybody who's lived in Tennessee for any amount of time or even drove through or whatever, you know, in Hickman County, you've got Bucks North, Tennessee. Now, again, it sounds like one of those gimmick towns, right? It sounds like, you know, what, what I'm trying to think of another example, but anyway, Bucks North, Tennessee is a real place. First of all, I actually was lucky enough to be part of a crew that shot a music video in Bucks North, Tennessee. (laughs) And that's a whole other story that I will not bore you with but bucks north tennessee how did you end up picking that as your as your home <laughs> uh, dirty white boy was uh from bucks north tennessee that was right yeah his claim yeah. that he, he was from bucks north tennessee so when they offered me the position of bunkhouse buck yeah it just yeah. naturally came in you know where's he from well hell the best yeah. place I know of is Bucks, North Tennessee. <laughs> what, exactly. It goes along perfect with the bunkhouse gimmick. Right, right, um, definitely. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's where we come in. Like you said, a lot of people saying, where's Bucks? Is there really a sense of, oh, yeah, you can't miss it. Right. It's right, right. there on the interstate, 60 miles west of Nashville. Yeah. You don't see a big green sign exit Bucks, North. Yeah, exit 152. That's uh, it. By the yeah. way, and, and I'll yeah. never forget, man. And this is the truth. I grew up in Nashville, being a Memphis fan, and I do remember, you know, them saying, you know, a white boy, you know, being from Bucks North, Tennessee, and I too thought that that was like parts unknown or something. It was those made up gimmicks. And I, my first trip to Memphis when I got uh, hired. I remember passing that exit and telling Jamie, oh, my God, there is there's actually a Bucks North Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I popped for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
I've got a real question actually here, and uh, Buck Snort was just kind of a, an appetizer here. So, you, how was it growing up? I mean, because I can imagine, you know, like you've got your cousins, right, Robert and Ron, and you yourself. I, you're what six 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 seven something like that. Yeah, about six five. Six five, okay, and then I know they're right at that. So really, right there, that is that is over a half of a, I would say a great size for basketball team. How <laughs> did you all ever get to play together as far as on a school team or anything? No, gotcha. Uh, uh, Ron, Ron six nine. Yeah, yeah. Well, he he he, he would have been the he, center. <laughs> yeah, he played ball at uh, Miami. Okay. He went yeah. To University of Miami played basketball there, and also at Clemson. Right. Right. Or a little started out at Clemson, and then transferred to Miami. And so yeah. he did real well in basketball. Me and Robert just piddled at it. Yeah. In high school, and then we got to wrestling right away. So we didn't we didn't go on to. I went to the College of Hard Knocks in uh, <laughs> New Orleans, Louisiana, on Burbank Street. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I mean, and not to knock that I'm a Memphis fan is just like everybody, but sometimes some of the Memphis guys were a little, um, not six, nine, but maybe closer to five, nine. How about that? <laughs> did you ever, <laughs> let me just ask this. Did you ever rib any of them about your height to them? And did you, did that ever, did you ever hear any ribs, even if it was just in the Southeastern locker room or whatever, but did you ever hear any funny stories about maybe, you know, I mean, superstar Bill Dundee, he was eight foot tall and bulletproof, you know, but when it came down to it, he wasn't that tall. So I, I just never could really, you know, do that. I, I rib guys about a lot of things. Gotcha. But I never, I never really ribbed a, a guy about being short. <laughs> okay, uh, fair enough. That's, that's where you drew the line. A <laughs> you know, lot, lot of the toughest guys I ever got in the ring with was a lot shorter than me. Adrian yeah. Street won, right? You well, know. Yeah, Adrian. Adrian was a very good wrestler, and then uh, you know the list goes on and on, man. I mean, you know, Frankie Kane. You ever remember him? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Frankie yeah. Kane was one of the toughest guys I ever knew, and he was quite a bit shorter than me, and I, I had a lot of respect for him. And, of course, Danny Hodge, you know, was yeah. uh, in the Olympics, and, and he was a little bit short. Man, I wrestled them both. Yeah. And uh, yeah. They, they were very good. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. just heard a story about Frankie Kane uh, from George Weingroff, uh, and I don't know that he said he was not, you know, not there. But the story, something about uh, uh, Mr. Wrestling came back and was gonna, uh, it was pissed off at uh, Frankie, and uh, then something in the locker room after the match, and I don't, I don't know what ensued after that. Do you have any idea of what I might be talking about? Yeah, Dennis Condry was there he saw the whole thing he told me that's about right it. And, and uh mr wrestling number two it was john it was johnny walker johnny uh, walker ended, yeah. he ended up on the bad end of the deal <laughs> you got the tail beat out of it <laughs> and, and now, mind you mind you johnny walker mr wrestling two was a tough man right he's a tough son of a gun buddy and uh but he's frankie kane his he was bad sure enough buddy and, was he some kind of boxer or something? Yeah, he could wrestle. He was a real good. He was a lot like Danny Hodge. Oh. He could wrestle and box. Gotcha. Mm. You know, Danny Danny wrestled and boxed in the Olympics. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, you know, man, the man was, was really nasty when he got mad. Oh. Uh, and, and I almost got the hell beat out of me in Arlington, Kentucky. My Frankie came one night. Me and him had an argument in the dressing room. Uh -huh. And I knew I was just a few seconds before getting it, so I shut my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I always knew when to shut up. <laughs> that's a good, that's a, yeah. So while we're on the subject of tough guys, uh, we can go back to like WCW. And obviously, Ming, I know you uh, worked him a lot. Uh, how, how tough is Ming? You know, everybody says it. I've, I've been around him, but give me your stories on him. Well, Ming was a personal bodyguard for the Emperor of Japan. Right. So that, yeah. that, that can tell you something right there. Yeah. Uh, he, he's uh, from the island of Tonga, 
and a big bad old dude that knows all karate, jujitsu. I don't know what all. Yeah, but I, I, I damn sure wouldn't want to make him mad at. Him. Have you ever <laughs> witnessed him, him perform? <laughs> oh yeah, I watched him perform, and and Robert Fuller told me about a story. The police was going to arrest him. There was oh. some trouble at a bar, and they left, and they took off walking, and the police came, surrounded them, and, and there was going to be some nasty trouble. And Robert did some fast talking and told him, "Let me let me talk to him, and we're, we're going to go with you." That he he wasn't going to let him put the handcuffs on him, right? And uh, yeah. they so he Robert talked him out of it, and they they went downtown with him, straightened the matter out. And, mm. So it was a good thing because. Maine was going to hurt a few of them before they got to it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <man>. That's wild. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> if I'm going out, I'm taking somebody with me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so we've got a listener request. So Donnie Davis, he's a good listener of ours. He wants you to talk about your time spent in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. He's a big Smoky Mountain fan. He's enjoyed you and your family's career. And he would love to hear, especially about how you – you know, you brought the stud stable from Ural's territory to, you know, you brought it to Smoky Mountain and you continued the storyline on, which, I mean, it's not like you went that far. But what I mean by that is you went to a new company with it. And I've always been a big fan of the stud stable. I just think it's a cool sounding name, if anything. You know what I mean? And yeah. the, and y'all's crew was always dominant and, and just got away with murder sometimes. And it was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but, you know, you got to talk about your time in Smoky Mountain, if you don't mind. We, well, you know, I've always, my wife's from Maribel, so, and I love East Tennessee, so we are kind of settled down here. Yeah. And Jim Cornette got the territory going. He had a guy backing him up, and he had the TV and everything going, and Robert was here. So we just naturally kind of stepped in there with him, you know. It uh, He had the Rock and Roll Express, so we had some great matches with them guys, you know. Oh, you yeah. can't have a good match with them, something's wrong with you. I was fixing right. to say the same thing. <laughs> uh, so it, it just fit out. And we, we worked with them. I stayed with Cornette, I guess, you know, six, seven, eight months. That the thing worked all over his territory. Uh, and then things, the money paddled out for Jim, uh-huh. I think. That, uh, he ended up uh, closing the territory, but... Hey, it worked out good there for a while. Yeah. So we said, man, I, I yeah. was looking at the the numbers, like uh, the 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 years of your career and everything. If you had to stay there, because we had just started doing the Memphis versus Smoky Mountain thing that did great in Memphis. Uh, and then it ended up that he closed the doors. But had you stayed a little bit longer in Smoky Mountain, I'd have got to work with you, Dad Gummit. <laughs> All right. I, was, yeah. I, I hate that I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. <laughs> I would have loved to have seen a stud stable PG-13 feud. That is just something that I never <laughs> thought of, and I love the idea of it. <laughs> it would have been there. I mean, we yeah. had, they brought in, uh, and I'm talking to, to Golden right now, they brought in rock and roll at first to, you know, get us over, to put us over as baby faces in Memphis. Then they followed it with Buddy Landell and Terry Gordy, Tracy Smothers, uh, who else, Jimmy? Am I missing anybody? Uh, uh, did you say, yeah, I mean yeah. the the Armstrongs. I mean it was it was nice, and I I really. And then we went there a couple of times and worked with uh, Dr. Tom and uh, Jimmy Del Rey and you know a few others, and we were the heels. So it, I, I wish we could have took it to the and I, everybody that comes on here from there. I'm like, God, if we only could have took it to that level in Knoxville, man, and had the state feud. You know, it would have been great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it would have. Uh, uh, I, I hate that that I missed it. Yeah, it just Jimmy Cornette ran out of money on that one a little, a little too soon. And, uh, but it it popped Memphis, man. It popped the territory over here, but we just never got to take it that way. And I hate that, but yeah, yeah. they they uh, you know when Ron was running Knoxville, uh, Lawler came over here and wrestled Robert mm-hmm. one or two times, and there was a couple of boys came from. From that end, that was back in the seventies. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but it was it was good, you know. Knoxville was doing really good at that time, and uh, 
It, it meant a lot to Laura to come over and work with Robert. I see somebody else that came from over there. I can't remember who, but they had a big card that where Ron was working with uh, Harley Race, I think, for the belt. Uh-huh. And I worked with Danny Hodge a couple times for the for the junior heavyweight belt, and and also with Nelson Royal. Yeah, Nelson. Yeah, Nelson Royal was a, he he was junior heavyweight. He beat uh, Danny Hodge there in the end for that belt. I never could beat either one of them, but I, <laughs> I had a few matches with him. And I thought I had it won a couple of times, but not quite there. <laughs> you didn't hook so the leg. It, 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 it was a, a, a real big experience. Yeah. Especially yeah. especially with Danny Hodge. I'm scared to death, boys. I'm going to tell you the truth. <laughs> there, yeah. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever see him pop the pliers in his hand? No, but I heard yeah. about he pop the pliers and he crush an apple. Yeah, crush an Dang. apple. Golly. Can you, I mean. Oh, he was <laughs> tremendously strong in his hands and his grip. But right. He, wore, he had a lot of natural strength, and then he worked on it all his life. He was rolling up newspapers and, you know, twisting things a lot, and he just naturally strong in his hands. Yeah. He'd grab a hold of you. I seen him grab a referee at Baton Rouge, Louisiana one night. He's on his, flat on his back. And the referee was bent over asking him if he wanted to give. And he reached up and grabbed the, the ref by his ankle. Yeah. And the referee had to sit down. You could tell <laughs> he couldn't stand it. He's going, Danny, Danny, Danny. And Danny's squeezing his ankle so bad he had to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, uh, he's a tremendous son and one heck of a wrestler, buddy. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. You know, another heck of a wrestler, since you said that so well. We've had him on the show, and actually, you talked about George Weingroff there, Wolfie. We had him on, and and, and this, I asked him this question, and he, he seemed to really regret it, was Ronnie Garvin and, and the Bob Roop tape that they put out there. Do you Do you remember how things were when that happened? When we had the split in Knoxville? Yeah, when you had the split in Knoxville, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, we, me and Robert was working for Jerry. Yeah. And Mick was in Nashville at the time, and uh, we had heard about the split, and so we ended up giving a notice to Jerry, and we came back, worked for Ron, try to help him out. Yeah. You know, because he's in a, got a big opposition going on here. And it was a it, it was sort of a nasty situation now. Yeah. Uh, Roop, Roop and Orton Jr., uh, uh, who, who else was over there with them? That was, was some tough guys, man. They, they was going to beat up Ron and Robert. And right. They was going to do this. They challenged Ron. They challenged Robert and they, in, the, in the newspapers. They wanted right. to come over and yeah. wrestle them. And, and I, so we, we were all hanging out. When the match was over with, we'd go to this certain bar in town. And uh, so I went down there one night after the matches, and Orton was in there, and Rupi Orton told me, he said, you almost slap your cousin right in the mouth one of these days. And I said, oh, okay, that, that's going to be real interesting. <laughs> um, I hope I'm going to be there to see it. And uh, yeah. so, But I never did see it. But i tell you what did happen. Dick Slater was here at the time. Hmm. And I, I had just turned heel, and I had a match with Slater at the Knoxville Civic Coliseum. We're in the ring, and Orton and Ruth were sitting on the front row, and they kept acting like they was going to get up and come in the ring. Mm. Well, Slater's telling them, come on in here, you son of a bitches. Mm-hmm. He's, daring them. He's daring them to come in the ring. And I'm saying, Dicky, what are you doing, man? Stay saved here. You know, oh, hell no. God, he's cussing them. He's telling them, come on. <laughs> come on up here and get you something. Else. Well, what in the hell am I going to do if they come in here? This is going to be a shoot. Right, right. right? Yeah. You know, so maybe one thing you can do, and that's fight it out. Yeah. Well, we we had to finish. We finished our match, and as soon as the, the bell rang, Slater slid it right out of the ring, and he went right to him. Uh-huh. And, and the crowd, they swamped him. I couldn't see anything from there anymore because they were covered with the fans. Wow. And Slater just tell them, dare them, stand up, stand up and take it like a man. And neither one of them would stand up. Really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you know Dick Slater. Oh, he's, yeah. 
I wouldn't stand up either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll tell him, calm down, Dickie. Take it easy. <laughs> He's, he stuck Sting's head in a toilet and flushed it. <laughs> so, And I mean, I'm not saying Sting is, is, is Danny Hodge or anything at all. I'm not saying that. But Sting was a pretty big fella at that point, you know, and sticking his head right. down. In, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Slater and, and Orton had already had trouble in in Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah, uh, in in the dressing room one night, and yeah, mm-hmm. I don't think Orton ended up on the good end of the stick there. <laughs> yeah. What I heard, I believe so, it. You know, Slater Slater was a tough cookie. You know, and he <laughs> he, he got a lot of guts, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's take a quick time out and get a word from one of my dope ass sponsors and we'll be right back with more Live and in Color with Wolfie D. Todd here from the Kayfabe Cave in Pulaski, Tennessee. On April 20th, 2024, from 12 noon to 3 p.m., the legendary Jimmy Golden will be in the house for a meet and greet. He will be in Bunkhouse Buck character as well for a great photo opportunity. For those of you who cannot make it in person, we will have a Facebook Live virtual signing from 3 to 4 p.m. Photo ops are $30. Autographed 8x10s or personal items are $30. A double autographed print of Jimmy and his other half, Bunkhouse Buck, is $40. We offer a combo which includes a photo op, autographed item of your choice, and an autographed event poster for $50. Don't miss this as Jimmy does not do many appearances anymore. This is a rare opportunity to meet a legend who has been in the ring with a you name them list of guys. For all updates and events, like and follow us on social media at the K-Fabe Cave. You know, the one of the big the, the big talk of the weekend, of course, uh, well, last week was WrestleMania was on, and and Cody finishing the story that, that Dusty didn't finish. Uh, now, I know you've obviously been around Dusty a lot, and Dustin, uh Talk about Dusty Rhodes and and your interactions and what he meant to the business and and that type of thing. I see. I went to I went down to Florida for Montgomery that era. You know when Lawler was there and all that. There was a couple of years, and I decided I, I need to get out and you know go to different territories and yeah yeah see what it was like. So I went down to Florida and wrestled. Of course, Buddy Fuller, my uncle was he was involved in the promotion end and stuff. So, but I was just one of the regular boys underneath boys, but. Eddie Graham liked me for some reason, um, mm-hmm. and he, they had me in a uh, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, one night. And the main event is this National Guard armored against Dusty Rhodes. Mm. Of course, I'm I'm again I'm scared to death. Uh, you know, I'm like, man, this is big time already. You know, what am I doing in here? <laughs> and I got I got in the ring, and we're getting instructions from the referee. And I looked over at Dusty, and he said to me, he said, I'm about six sheets in the wind, baby. <laughs> and I said, what? What What does this mean? You know, he's, he, I don't know what he means. He's six sheets in the wind to me. Then, like, he's got a hell of a buzz <laughs> going on. So I think, well, we'll just do the best we can. And we had one hell of a match, man. I mean, yeah. I, he, I'm looking like a million dollars. <laughs> so, you know, and, and uh, we went right around. I ended up getting beat. And they, the only fans, they come see Dusty. They didn't come see me. Right. Yeah. But I ended up losing to Dusty. But place was sold out. And that, that was one of my first matches with Dusty. But Dusty, Dusty, at that time in Florida, he was the man. Yeah. He, no he, doubt. he was in the main event just about everywhere they went. And he drew a lot of money for him. So, you know, and then, then later on, I got to work with him again as Bunkhouse Buck. You know, I mm-hmm. was working with his son and had the yeah. big feud with his son, and, and Dusty finally got involved. And when we had a pay per view, the Nasty Boys were involved, and me and Rock uh, Slater. Uh, see who we had a couple other guys with us. I forget who it was. Funk, Terry Funk, I think. And, uh-huh. and uh, but anyway, we had a. Had a pay per view match in in Rome, Virginia, mm-hmm. 
but it, it, it was good. D- WCW while I was there was was good. The yeah. bunkhouse thing was easy for me. I just, you know, Robert called him one day and he said, hey, man, he, he told me when he went down there. He said, if I can get you in down now, I'll get you in. I said, okay. So he, he was managing Sid Vicious. Yeah. And he said, call, I got a message on the machine. I called him. He said, we, we're doing this. And he said, we're looking for a guy that looks like this. I said, well, I'm your man. <laughs> I'm your man. When, when do I start? So we went to work for WCW, and, and things clicked pretty good. Uh, uh, Buckhouse kind of got over it. Dusty, yeah. with the Dustin and then they brought in Dustin, Dusty, the daddy and we had some good stuff Wasn't that you and Dustin that had that match on the back of a semi? No, that was Barry Dorso yeah. Oh, dang, I thought it was, I thought it was him Yeah, yeah Blacktop Bully Blacktop Bully, but, uh, yeah Got him yeah. fired <laughs> because they bled on a match they weren't supposed to. But let me because you were talking about Bunkhouse Buck, and and if I'm just kind of imagining the gimmick, right? And you can tell me if I'm wrong or right. Is he kind of like maybe like the leader of a bunch of cowboys, kind of like a, a, a ranch hand? But he's maybe like the old veteran in the in the room that's kind of fought every one of them and and kind of earned that spot. Is that who Bunkhouse Buck was? What was the gimmick yeah. exactly? Yeah, uh, Bunkhouse was considered a, uh, a a guy that worked on the farm. Of Colonel Parker had a farm in Bucks North. Yeah, and the yeah, Bunkhouse ran the farm for him. He ran the the Bunkhouse, right, where all the hands lived. Yeah, uh, so he he'd say who came and went in the Bunkhouse and ran and worked on the farm. So he's a, he's like a farmer cowboy yeah. type guy, just a a pig, actually, that's <laughs> nasty all the time, spitting tobacco juice everywhere, and, yeah. you know, yeah. just, you, know, you don't you don't want to be around him at all. He stinks. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Gene used to go all the time in the interviews, like God Almighty, Buck, you ever take a bath? <laughs> what does it matter to you? You don't you don't have to worry about what I stink or not. You don't like it, leave. <laughs> so, so, so I, I can imagine now of course they've prettied it up for hollywood but if you if you watch the show yellowstone and for some of our listeners i'm sure some of y'all watch yellowstone you would essentially be the rip of the yellowstone uh universe right yeah. the yeah. the big yeah. the big dog that's just below the the boss i get it that makes sense right yeah that's the foreman of the farm. <laughs> the yeah. one who okay. takes him what, to the what, train what station. What a foreman. <laughs> yeah. Can <laughs> you imagine a guy like Bunkhouse running your farm? <laughs> <laughs> You'd be you sure. underwater in no time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that would be tough. That would be tough. Oh, gosh. So Jack Swagger's dad, I didn't know you had him as a son back in the day, what, early early 80s maybe. But when did you find out that he was your long-lost son? (laughs) The the, the day that, uh, let's let's see, Michael Hayes. Yeah. I saw him down at the uh, Gulf Coast Wrestling Reunion. Uh, okay. Back when okay. Lee Fields ran it, I, I was went down there, and, and there's Michael Hayes out there. The place is full of old guys, and mm-hmm. uh, at, right at the end, as he was leaving out in the parking lot, I didn't even know Michael was there. There's Michael. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, hey. So I just talked to Michael a few uh, a few minutes, and we left. But Michael was the booker in New York. So next thing I knew, a few months later, uh, a, a lady called from WWE. She said. Your your name has been mentioned for the uh, for the tombstone thing, and I'm like, well, I don't know what you're talking about the tombstone. She said, yeah, they want you. They thought about you doing it. And so I said, okay, how much does it pay? She said, no. She said, let me get back with you in a few hours. She called back, and gave me a figure, and I said, I'm your man. <laughs> you know, I knew Michael had kind of set the deal up. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I didn't, I wasn't working at the time. I didn't want to wrestle. Uh, I, I thought I might get a job as a agent or a referee or anything. You know, I was going to do anything that I could get. Yeah. So yeah. I, I thought by taking the tombstone and the choke slam from Kane that I might get my foot in the door. Right. So yeah. I said, we went up there and I, I did the deal of Jack Swagger's daddy. 
And uh, we did work that angle between him and Kane, and, and I ended up taking the, the choke slam and the tombstone for my son. He ran out on me. I uh, know. He, so he left his daddy. He left his daddy to take the ass whooping. <laughs> so disrespectful. Taking the dirt bag. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on top. i got to straighten that boy out, man. <laughs> you really are. I can't believe you let him treat you like that, Mr. Gold. So what, 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 what did you get from Jack, though? He seems like he's a pretty level-headed, intelligent guy as far as I'm sure he was extremely respectful to you. Oh, yeah. He's a real nice guy. Yeah, and he he played he played football and wrestled in Oklahoma. So there you go. Who else did that? Doctor Death, Steve Williams. So yeah. it's pretty good company right there. You know. Yes. <laughs> so he's a good boy. Yeah, and, yeah. And I he, loved it. He, I popped so much. I was like, oh my god! I knew who you were from the second I saw you, and I was like, oh my gosh! And it, it's like crazy when I I don't always watch the show, but it's like whenever I do, something happens. Like Dutch Mantel shows up, or Jimmy Golden <laughs> shows up, yeah, something yeah. crazy, and I'm like, holy yeah. cow! I was meant to be watching tonight because. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So I thought, you know, a hell out of work for him. I, right. I'd have stayed uh, Jack Swagger's daddy, managed like Dutch did or anything, but they never could get get it done. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it was Michael P.S. Hayes. Yeah. Okay. Michael Hayes sitting up with that. What a yeah. group they were. The three oh. birds. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> you worked with quite a bit, didn't you? I worked with him some. Uh, Terry Gordy. I mean, I, I thought Terry was. He a lot like Lawler, Dick Slater, and all these guys that was a natural for the business. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Gordy was a big, burly guy. And that. What a hell of a worker, man. Mm-hmm. I thought he was great in his interviews, you know. He, he'd get the tuning up, and his lip bottom lip and start quivering. And, <laughs> yeah. And like, man, yeah. That boy's serious, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he's yeah. upset, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he was incredible. And just a big, rugged hoss, you know, man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to ask you the question, and, and the listeners know what's coming. Uh, <laughs> I ask this of a lot of people, but it's a question that I hate it when somebody asks it of me because it's a hard question to answer for a number of reasons. Uh, who is, or maybe what's the best match, or who's the best person? Uh, and see, the reason I say that it's a tough question is because I got a lot of matches that are my favorites for different reasons. Maybe the crowd wasn't that big, but it was a great match, or it was a, a big crowd, but not my favorite match, those types of things. But what sticks out in your mind and, and your long career of, man, that was I was on that night, you know what I mean? I, I tell you, uh, where, I, where I really learned a lot and out of one match, Mm-hmm. I had a match in Montgomery, Alabama. I was about 22 years old with Dory Funk Jr. Wow. For the World Heavyweight Championship. And I learned a lot in that match. Dory, Dory to me was first class. Now, what a class act he was. Heck of a worker. And just, uh, I, I admired his work. And uh, so, like I said, I learned a lot in that match. But I'll never forget it. Yeah. When you say you learned a lot more on the psychology side of the business, would you say? I mean, that he just taught you. Yeah. 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 How to just work, you know, high spots and with a lot of punches thrown in forearms. Yeah. Uh, You know, he he was, uh, we've had a lot of good champions. Yeah. NWA champions. And and Dory was one of them. Uh, You know, everybody that that held that belt was was really good and then earned it. Yeah, I guess Dory was probably my favorite. I had a match with Jack Briscoe in in uh, Montgomery, and one also in Orlando. Uh, and then I worked those junior title matches with Danny Hodge and Nelson Royal. Yeah. Learned a lot in those matches, also. Uh, and I had respect for all those guys. Yeah, but, yeah. But then there was a lot of good matches, man. We, me and Robert were. You know, the stud stable with the Rock and Roll Express. I would tore the house down a few times. That, yeah. That, there, was, there was some other there some times, man, that uh, we did that down in South Alabama, and there was a boy named Roger Smith. He was the assassin yeah. under the mask, and a boy named Jerry Stubbs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so, man, it, they, they had to follow us, and, and I'm looking at them thinking, well, good luck. 
<laughs> and they're, they're in a single match now. Yeah. And we were in tag matches. Makes it a little easier. Yeah. But I, I'd be in the shower and I could hear the building. And you'd think the building was coming down. <laughs> so man, boys is good, man. Uh-huh. Yeah. That Roger Smith, a big bump taken, and they and Jerry Stubbs, they yeah. they were good. They they oh, go right up there and follow it. Yeah, that's awesome. Let me. Okay, we just had a question come in. I'm not even kidding. It's last minute, but I, one of our listeners, Ben Martin, he always asks good questions. He says, "Have you interviewed Jimmy Golden yet?" And I'm actually like, "I am right now." <laughs> he says, "Because I've been watching a lot of Southeastern lately, and Jimmy is feuding with Ron and Robert in 1981." His question is this: The three of them mention growing up together. A lot of promos. They make fun of each other a lot especially when they're feuding. He's asking, was there anything ever said on the promos that caused problems between you guys later? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> it, it worked. It worked. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean. Yeah. The last thing we said was true. <laughs> you know, the truth shall set you free. Right, exactly. <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen, amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know they turned me heel. Uh, Jerry Jerry was was the first one, that, and I had been wanting to heel for a long time. Mm-hmm. Just didn't have the opportunity. We worked in Memphis, and uh, Jerry told Robert, "said Jimmy go, I think he'd make a good heel." And I'm going, "Yeah, man, just give me the chance." Yeah. And and they did. So I turned heel there for Jerry there for a while, and then we came back to help Ron during the big split uh, here in Knoxville. Yeah. And and I turned heel on them. Uh, I actually turned on on Uncle Buddy, their dad, one night in, in Knoxville. There, me and uh, I forget my partner's name. I was Babyface, and we was wrestling uh, Mr. Fuji at Tor Tanaka, mm-hmm. and gorgeous George Junior was managing them. Yeah, and okay. I ended up turning on Buddy Fuller, and we we picked him up. Uh, uh, and, and Fuji, me and Tanaka was holding him. I was holding him around his chest, face up, and Tanaka had him by his legs. And Fuji got on the top rope and did a swan dive off, belly to belly. Wow. On him, we let him go. Pow! He hit that mad buddy. It, it, it was awesome. Yeah. And uh, they carried him out on a stretcher, buddy. And the next day on TV, Ron and Robert, they both having a fight to see which one's going to get me first. <laughs> There's no good worthless rattlesnake. The only thing you do with a snake is cut his head off. And that's what they was going to do to me. And, and and we went to Harlem, Kentucky that night. And my first match was against Robert. Yeah. And I had uh, I had a boy named Norvell Austin standing in the background back there. Yeah. He's the only black boy in Harlem. <laughs> yeah, I bet. And Ever. Harlem, when, the, <laughs> when the time's right, you hit the ring, and we're going to kick the shit out of Robert. <laughs> and uh, we did. We did. So that, that was our first turn heel, and, and then we did the same thing down in Alabama. You know, it just, I, I was the snake. I was the turncoat. Yeah. So somebody's got to do it, and I volunteered. Yeah, and that, that's back, man. When you could actually get real heat, you know. You, yeah, I, I know you. You've you've lived through many decades of the business, so it's like when you started. You know, the people. I think there's always been a question mark for people about wrestling, but then in the '80s, you know, you had the whole Vince thing, and pretty much took the question mark away. And of course, now there's no doubt. But you, I think you could still make them believe. But what my point is, and my question is, from the time where it's and, and I've been in the business long enough to where I was on the tail end of some of them big country towns. You know, I've been in one riot and people jumping in and things like that when they really believed that it was so much more fun uh, when it was like that. And you lived through that and then the turn of it. Can you kind of explain like what it was like then? And then di- how did you kind of feel the shift in the people and, and then the difference of the way you had to work to try to make them believe, even if it's only for five minutes. Do, do you feel my question? Yeah. Uh, everything everything was so tight and so close that you know, we had so many good boys in the ring. Like Ronnie Garvin and Tor Tanaka and guys, I mean, you know, there was some matches that I was in that, that uh, 
En dan hoop ik heel lekker gaan uit of ik. Dat viel ik niet. Ja. So it was really snug. Uh, still. Ja. Uh, you know, I mean, they, they, uh, Mongolian Stomper hit Joe the Duke in the head with a sledgehammer. He had a, a cinder block on top of his head. Oh my yeah. God. Stomper, Stomper, Stomper put, sat down in a chair, put a towel over his bald head, and put a big concrete block on top of it. And he, that gorgeous <laughs> Wards Jr., his manager, took a sledgehammer and broke that block on top of his head. Mm. And it just actually went through the block and hit him in the head and split his head open. Oh. <laughs> so they challenged, they challenged Joe the Duke to do the same thing. Well, when he did it, the block was twice as big. Mm. And George was going to hit him with it. The stomper standing there. He shoved George out of the way, grabbed the hammer. He hit Joe because mm. they got a big angle going on. Yeah. He put Joe in the hospital, man. He had surgery on his neck. And Oh, shit. You know, things like that happen in the business. Yeah. And, that, you know, people look at that and they can't not. This is real, man. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, so there was a lot of things that happened like that. We had the people convinced a lot that we we was beating the hell out of each other. And, and that ain't no lie. Right. Right. Uh, you know, it was, was still. Uh, anyway, I, I was going to tell you that night that Norvell hit the ring in Harlem. Mm-hmm. We we slid out of the ring and I was, we were going to start strutting. The guy picked up a folding chair and folded it and threw it and it comes spinning at my face like a flying saucer going around and around and around. <laughs> and uh, I got just I got my hand up just in enough time to hit my hand and I knocked it down. Hmm. I, it would have knocked all my teeth out. Oh yeah. man! So I, I looked at Novell and I said, uh, "Baby, one thing to do from here, buddy." And that's to get in that dressing room door. Yep. Because they, they're coming. They're yep. coming to get us. Yep. <laughs> yep. That almost exact same thing happened to me in Mississippi. Uh, the guy threw a chair from like the third row, and I just happened to be turning around about the time it got to my face, and it hit me in the chin. I still got the little scar up under my lip where it busted my, my chin open. And and then people were coming, too, and thank God the baby faces were smart enough. Uh, we had like Steve Dunn and a couple of others that were, you know, smart and knew what to do and uh, come out there and, told you know, start hitting us and driving us back to the dressing room we got them we got them you know because the people was gonna get us yeah. They didn't. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 yeah yeah it can get scary because you don't know who's got a knife on them you know right 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 buddy yeah. fuller got cut in marietta georgia i believe it was marietta uh as uh von bronner's oh wow the german team the von bron kirk and saul weingroff yeah we managed by saul weingroff they had a riot that people was trying to kill him and Buddy went out there to save him while he was helping him fight some people off. He got cut. Mm. He, he didn't know it until he got back in the dressing room. And he looked down his sides and some of his guts is hanging out. Oh, my God. He could see it burning. So somebody sliced him in the side. Uh, so, yeah, it can it can be real nasty. I've seen my daddy a bunch of times as a promoter go out there and try to save the boys and help them yeah. get to the dressing room. Yeah. It, it could be dangerous. It's, heck, I was, heck uh, Mario Glinto, uh, he climbed out the bathroom window or the dressing room window in Florence, Alabama and ran to his car to get away. And they <laughs> caught him. As he got in the car and they picked the car up, he's in a Cadillac. They oh, picked it up off the ground so he couldn't leave. That's how many <laughs> people had him surrounded. Holy crap. And his wife. His wife came out behind the mob. She was, they forgot about her. And she had a 45 automatic in her purse. <laughs> she shot it off one time in there and said, set her down, boys. Oh, uh, set her down. oh my God. <laughs> That's they, a movie they right there. Mario. <laughs> <laughs> so is, is it true? Did you, did you see that? It was the tales from the territories and it was talking, you know, when they were talking about Memphis and that Jerry Jarrett told the story about absolutely pull and, and I don't I believe in speaking ill of the dead. I, we love Jerry Jarrett on this show, but do you know the story about him plucking Mario's eyeball out and dropping it or something? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I've heard there yeah. might've been a little, uh, Fish exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I heard. I wasn't there at the time, but 
Uh, story I got, Mario was trying to uh, get back into business. He'd been out for a while. Yeah. Uh, and he wanted to do it because he was over so well in Memphis back in the early days when Buddy Fuller promoted it. Right. Uh, uh, and I, 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 he had some heat with the office, I assume, and he tried to uh, interfere in a match or something, and they, they beat the shit out of him. That's what I got. They <laughs> yeah. slid his head open. Tojo hit him with his shoe. Yeah, <laughs> or something split his head, and, and then uh, Jerry, I think maybe did something to his eye, tried to pull his eye out or something, and things got real nasty. Uh, so I, I don't know, you know, Mario could be a wild and crazy guy. He took a lot of pills. Uh, yeah, he'd get all buzzed up and he'd go in the ring, and he didn't care if you killed him. Right. Uh, wow. Him, him and Buddy Fuller had a match in Mobile, Alabama. Back in 1958 at Lab Stadium, they drew 30,000 people back Damn. then. Wow. That was a long time yeah. ago. And yeah. They, Buddy told Mario, he said, we'll shoot on every other punch, and every other punch will work. And he said, I'll give you the first one. He said, bust this left eye over here for me. Okay. Like we go. Okay, boss. So we got in the ring, and Mario backed him into the ropes and hit him right in the nose, broke his nose. Mm. It ended up both of his eyes were swollen shut. But Damn. once he did that, then the fight was on, and Buddy just <laughs> beat the hell out of it, busted both of his eyes, and but he didn't care. Yeah, <laughs> he didn't care. Sputnik Monroe told Fuller one night. He said, "I did." I did five hard ways this week. Every time you do a hard way, you pay a bonus. Yeah. yeah. You owe me such and such because I did five hard ways this week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, guys back in them days, and Buddy had a knack that boys really liked him, and they'd go to the end of the rope for him. Yeah. Right. A lot of them would do a hard way. And, uh, you know, I've heard like Gypsy yeah. Joe didn't like using a razor blade because he would prefer a hard way. Is that just the old timers way? Like they just preferred to do the hard way and not have to carry the blade around? Or was this just certain guys or? Yeah, I guess I, I, I like that hard way and you could sport that eye around. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All week gotcha. long, you know, fans see that, damn, who's that? What is that guy, man? His eye's a mess. Yeah. And that's like, great. Like Sputnik Monroe, man. He's a, he's a heavyweight, mid-south heavyweight champion. Yeah. You know, Sputnik went to the to the Mid South Fair one year, years ago. He was a heavyweight champion, and he's he drunk, and he uh, he tried to pick a fight with everybody there, and nobody wanted to take him up on his challenge because <laughs> they knew who he was. He he's a heavyweight wrestling champion, and you don't mess with him. Yeah. So he couldn't, he couldn't find nobody to fight him, and he saw two cowboys sitting up on the fence rodeo there too. And they're they're standing there by their horses, and he tried to pick a fight with them cowboys, and they said, no, sir, Mr. Monroe, one of them horses bumped up against him, and he turned around and slapped that horse, and when he did that, he, he found the fight he was looking for. Oh, the man. The cowboy come up there and beat the shit out of him. <laughs> Golly. <laughs> yeah, you can talk about... He was drunk. You can talk he about... Drunk. He couldn't win his fight. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about you know sporting the hard way around and the black eye and all that and that's man i love that and i and i miss that about the business and i believe that you can still make people believe if you do things like that and it, this is just going back to 94 doug gilbert and tommy rich did a thing where they they put my eye out on tv and uh so and i lived in nashville you know and and i i went around with uh vaseline in like i'd put it like in my eye and then take some uh, cigarette ashes. I didn't smoke, but I get some ashes from somebody that did, and and put it all around my eye, and just made it look like it was leaking. And you know, so when people would see me, you know, fans would see me, they'd be like, "Oh my god!" And I mean, I wore it around when I didn't have to, but I just <laughs> I miss that man. I miss that about the business, and and just K Fabe's not dead. I just think it's not practiced well anymore. That's right. I you know, think you're right about that. Uh, that that deal I did with Dustin. Rose on at the uh, center stage in Atlanta, WCW. I'm going to hit him with a trophy in the back. He's having a fight. And uh, I told him, I said, the first three licks, I'm going to get you. Mm. From there on, I'm going to be working. 
<laughs> and then you're going to get your turn. It's going to be your turn to mock the hell out of me. So, But the first three licks I hit him with that trophy, I left the mark on him. Yeah. <laughs> that boy was back at the gym here in Maryville. They said, oh, damn, boy. You know, Dustin was serious, wasn't you? I said, yeah. <laughs> I, hit, I, I hit him for real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, That's how yeah. you make him believe. Yeah. Man, this has been an incredible. I, I love your stories, Jimmy. This is this has been great, man. Uh, Jimmy, big dummy, will you plug where he's going to be one more time for us? <laughs> yes, of course. Our buddy Todd Camp in the Kayfabe Cave. He's doing a signing this Saturday, April twentieth, twelve p.m. to three p.m. And again, it's at one ten South First Street, Pulaski, Tennessee. Do not miss your chance to see Jimmy Golden, y'all. I mean, he's going to be signing bunkhouse buck he's going to be signing jimmy golden i think todd even told me that there's a chance to get both signed on one sheet so i it's a cool opportunity plus you know supporting todd is awesome the kayfabe cave we love him jimmy yeah. golden and, and the, the kayfabe best. cave has an incredible mascot that was uh drawn by me okay i'm just gonna oh, put okay. stuff over you know the yeah. kayfabe cave captain kayfabe uh, that's my guy that I came up with for Todd, and and uh, go, you, I think he sells pictures of the Captain K Fabe you might could get. So uh, go on down there and support Todd, support Jimmy, support pro wrestling, and uh, get on down there and see him. Yeah, yeah. 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. Do not miss it. April 20th. Looking forward to it, guys. Uh, yeah. K Fabe, that's what a great name. I know. And I love to meet the fans and talk to them, talk wrestling. Yeah. yeah, man. Uh, yeah. And again, you've got so many stories um, that we ain't even touched the tip of the iceberg, man. So uh, fans go down there. And if you didn't get some of the questions answered uh, today, go see Jimmy and, and ask him uh, to his face. And I'm sure you'll be entertained by his answers. So yeah, get on down there. And, and Jimmy, uh, like I said, thank you once again for coming on here. It's been a pleasure. Uh, you're, you're a professional and uh, very, very honored to have you come on here and talk to us uh, it's been a pleasure guys uh, thank thanks you sir for having me absolutely yes, thank all right you. you have a good rest of your day there in maryville tennessee and uh we'll, we'll talk to you sometime in the future we'll see you we'll see you april the 20th in pulaski thank you all sir right. have a good day all right Thanks, Jimmy. all right so again awesome and we're coming right back with ask wolfie d anything a uh, dj hit the music All right, we are back with Ask Wolfie D anything. And man, just once again, Jimmy Golden and Bunkhouse Buck, whatever yeah. you call him, what a cool He came game. through, man. He came he through did. with a great show. Yeah, he did. And, uh, you know, honestly, that's a guy I want to get an autograph from. And if, if you want to do that, you need to be at the Kayfabe Cave in Pulaski, yeah. Tennessee on April 20th from 12 to 3 p.m. Our buddy Todd Camp and the family and the crew, man. Great, sh wife, great place, Jessica. great store. Wife, yeah. wife, Jessica. Yeah, absolutely. So go support them. If you support them, consider it the same as supporting us. Just send us $20 each <laughs> <laughs> when you do it. No, just kidding, but you can. But anyway, no, seriously, go see him at the Kayfabe Cave. But importantly, just thank you all for listening to that because, man, Jimmy's awesome, you know. Very much so. That was very fun. I love, you know, for me, there's some of these that are, they're all good, but like, I don't know, he's just been around so long and, 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 and has a good memory on his career and the things that he's heard and things that have happened. And, you know, I love hearing all them old stories. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Me too. Me too. All right. Well, our very first question today from the listeners is Michael Hauser. And this is timely. You know, he says, I just watched you at WrestleMania 13. I have a question for Wolfie. Was the necklaces that you and Jamie wore real gold? If so, <laughs> you must have been making decent paydays or had an angel. Wink, wink. Oh. No, yeah. those were uh, uh, Jim Cornette called us and said you know we're sending you some money to go shopping basically and mm -hmm. uh, 
get the outfits and everything. And we went to, it was like a flea market sort of deal in Memphis. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember the, the word swap meet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> gotta be it uh so yeah man we just found and that was you know around the time when you could find stuff like that pretty easily and uh they're they're fake as hell the teeth the gold teeth the gold chains the rings it was it was cheap as it could be so the answer to that would be no but we were making decent paydays not to mention you know i've said it before working memphis wwe and ecw all around the same time so our schedule was full so we we're doing all right yeah, yeah. No, and it, you know, it just, it completed the look, you know, you had to have yeah. the gold necklace and stuff. But, I, you know, I can imagine that the bumps you guys were taking, you didn't just, hold on, uh, Legion of Doom, let me take my necklace <laughs> off here. Yeah, get my necklace so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that was a great answer, and we're glad that you guys, you know had that time there because it was, you know, a big part of your career. Okay, so the next question we have is from Miguel mp 7 uz I'm not All kidding, right. on YouTube. And he says, what was the biggest difference between Jeff Jarrett from the USWA to TNA? The biggest difference between Jeff and USWA and TNA. Um, Wrestling-wise, I mean, you got some quite a few more years' experience um, on him. So in the ring – Jeff was better and plus he was usually a heel which I don't know it just seems like a lot of us like being a heel better and the best comes out as you comes out of you as a heel um but as far as personality wise like USWA and Jeff's always a kayfabe guy uh you know um Rode with Jeff a few times, hung out with him a few times and stuff like that. But, you know, Jeff did separate himself from the boys a lot because, you know, his dad ran the company and and that kind of thing. Uh, TNA, though, was, you know, there wasn't no road trips you know, when I was with him. Uh, it was Wednesday night in Nashville. He lived in Hendersonville. I lived in Nashville. And everybody just, you know, come to the show except for the guys that had to be flown in and whatnot or drove in. So you didn't have a road life with TNA per se. Um but just man, Jeff, just business. He's always Jeff. Uh, USWA, you come in, Jeff would be there. You know, one of the first people to get there, be sitting uh, in the dressing room reading the newspaper. Mm. Uh, and then the thing that would have changed from then is now when you see Jeff, he's replying to something on his phone he's he's on his phone you know he's one of those people that I, I believe it's a lot of you know he's not trolling facebook or nothing but he's answering people probably doing a lot of business transactions and it's almost hard to get his attention you know those people that you're talking to and they're looking at their phone they look up at you every once in a while you know what I'm saying? yeah yeah and yeah they're kind of hearing yeah. you but they're not and, but his is not in a in my belief is not in a rude way it's just Dude, Jeff's always been like that. He's go, 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 go. Yeah, yeah. And he's yeah. always, you know, he's always got something cooking. Irons in the fire. Exactly. Irons in the fire. That's that's the best way to say it. So, yeah. You know, when when you look at somebody like Jeff, there it's not an accident that he gets to where he is in company. Yeah. You yeah. know. He knows, and and the wealth of of just knowledge that he has in his brain, not just counting the stuff that his dad taught him or Jerry right. Lawler or whoever taught him. And, and we just got through talking about, you know, I asked Jimmy the question of, you know, about Jerry Jarrett. Did he steal it? Did he do this? And then it's kind of like he out coached him, and that's what I see that with Jeff. It's like he outplays you, he out coaches you. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to business deals and shit, you know, a lot of people, you know, mad over the the China thing. Well, I mean, he outcoached them on that. They let his contract run out. (laughs) So, I mean, he just he made a play, man. Yeah. I think he actually did that twice to Vince. He like (laughs) stood him up. I mean, and he got his money. I mean, I you know, there's a thing called a draw, right? The guys can take their money from the draw. And that's usually coming from the gate. Right. That that night. And if if you want 
wanted to cash or get part of your check in, in cash. You know, and I think he knew that the building had the money that he was asking for. It, it's He actually goes into it pretty deep on his podcast, and I don't know what episode it is, but anyway, go check it out. And, and he talks about how he kind of stood him up twice, actually, you know, well, and, and know under, that, yeah, the Ultimate Warrior actually is another one that kind of did that. But yeah, I think Jeff is just much more of a savvy businessman than, than Jim Helwig was. But, you know, <laughs> either way. Yeah. Very, very entertaining guy and very talented and knowledgeable guy about the business. It's it's really Jeff. Jeff is definitely one of the all time business greats, I would say, you know, oh, yeah. as far as Absolutely. Knowing, knowing the business in and out. But anyway, all right. The last question we have today is from at Kyoku Jinru Disciple 9349 on YouTube. It says, if PG-13 had more traction in the Monday Night Wars, who would have been your ideal dream feuds for PG-13? Let's say if you were booking the big three at the time, WWE, WCW, and ECW, who would have been some feuds that you could have taken to the big time and and shown what's up so I, i'm so this is not a question of in the wwe when we were there if they would have let us go on our own yeah let you be pg-13 who are some guys that you could have had a really good long drawn out feud with I'm trying to think at the time uh man at the time there wasn't you know everybody was monsters right then yeah uh, yeah I, I had to really think about the roster. I mean, of course, uh, I'm thinking size wise, man. Been great to work with with Owen. Um, oh man, yeah. Owen and Brett. I mean, God, that just sounds like, oh uh, yeah. Put yourself over, Wolfie. <laughs> they, said, they said dream. Okay, I can dream big if I'm gonna dream. Of course. Uh, but I know that those matches would have been hella matches. Um, oh my God. Let me think. I'm trying to think who else was there that, uh, you know, would it be comparable size wise? Because I could I could sit here and say you know, a lot of names we couldn't have had as heels. We could have had a few good matches. We couldn't have had a long, drawn out angle with the Road Warriors. OK, right. we just we couldn't have done that. Um, that wouldn't have been believable. Right. Um so, yeah, somebody, somebody like Owen and Brett, I mean, that would have been incredible, but it would obviously had to be some, you know, lower card guys to start out with. See, I'm trying, I'm trying to think realistically. Sure. You, they asked me to dream. Um, I mean, the headbangers, you know? Oh, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's perfect, actually. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yes, that's yeah. absolutely perfect. Yeah. The headbangers would have been perfect, you know? Yes, because- that would have been a great way to start it off. Uh, and, you know, I, w- I would have preferred to have been the heels, and I'm sure they would have got over really good as baby faces against oh, yeah. us. Yeah, that would have oh, yeah. been incredible. Yes. Yeah, the headbangers would have been great. I mean, the New Age Outlaws could have been great. You know, I, I do yeah. kind of see some very strict similarities in the in the New Age Outlaws and you guys. You had the, the guy who was the talker, and you had the guy who was the in ring general. You mm-hmm. had the guy who who was super athletic and could do anything. You could yeah. have, you know. So I mean, that would have been good. Not as good as the headbangers, I think. Think, but uh, yeah, because I, I mean, the gimmicks are perfect. Would have been you know? perfect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you know, you, you theoretically, I, I think the Rock and Roll Express were around some of those times, but I, I don't know that it would have meant the same as it did in USWA, of course. Yeah, but, well, I'm hey, with you. I'm totally with you. I'm glad you reminded me of that though. The headbangers that would have been, if I was booking and I had that option to put those two together, there's so much you could have done with that. Um, oh man! At yeah. that time, it was, like I said, the gimmicks match, and we got history with them. It ain't like we ain't never worked them before, you know? Right. So, right. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it would have been incredible, and I, I think that's the way to start it. And maybe yeah. you know that's where See, it needs to that's go. That's why you're my dude, man. <laughs> you saved me on shit like that that I can't think of. Well, you know that's what I'm here for, brother. That's so. right. <laughs> but that's you all we got. Big today. dummy, you big dummy. <laughs> I can't do it right now. <laughs> you Is that big your friend dummy? Stanford. Yeah, it's my friend Sanford. Yeah. Oh Lord, we the coming home. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I'm coming to join you. <laughs> I love him, man. Red Fox is so good. Have you ever heard his his uh, stand up stuff, man? Oh yeah, yeah, dude. He's like, he's like, you got to wash your ass. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he's like, he's like, if you think that your lover will not know that you have not washed your ass, <laughs> hell, 
the nose nose. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I love red. Man, I can watch Red Fox all day, man. That's love awesome. It. That's a good impersonation. So next oh. week. Uh, we'll have you as the guest, but you'll be as the Red Fox. Hey, I'm back from the dead, mother. <laughs> <laughs> I love wrestling. You think, I love like wrestling? Some... you think Red Fox watch wrestling? You know, that would be incredible if he did. I love me some <laughs> damn Bruno San Martino. <laughs> Thunderbolt Patterson. Oh, Thunderbolt. <laughs> Thunderbolt was the one, man. I love me. I love Ernie Ladd, the big cat. You know, one night I was out. With the with the boys and big cat Ernie Lad came in there, took every woman in the building. Uh. <laughs> oh me, that's good. Hey, and and and, and we'll end it here. Uh, but uh, that's great. Uh, Thunderbolt on the uh, the induction Hall of Fame, of course. Uh, Polly, great speech. What a what a talker he is. Uh, but Thunderbolt, man. See, I, I never really got to see thunderbolt much right. so they right. were showing clips of his interviews and stuff and man you if, if you hadn't watched that part of it go back and watch that oh, because great. there's yeah. a lot of people that that took stuff from him they had road dog on he's like i was doing stuff that i forgot and i stole from him you know <laughs> he really didn't even realize he was stealing you know yeah. and, and yeah. dusty the way dusty yeah. moved in the ring and things like that and uh oh, totally. the way he would start to cuss and then he'd stop and then bless his heart you know they they get him on the stage there and he does his thing and his is basically his whole uh hall of fame speech was a sermon uh yeah. a, a lot of uh, religion in it and uh he wasn't ashamed at all and it was cool man it was really cool and he kind of would get into that character but he was also in preacher mode and right. yeah i liked it man i liked it but anyway yeah. yeah it was great and you know he was big buddies with ole anderson that i've learned through all these interviews that we've done and with other yeah. guys you know he was big buddies with ole and it was funny man he, he's there's some great stories going around with that but you know he was of course dusty was like took a lot from thunderbolt you know mm -hmm. and you know what, since you brought this up i always see some of the the hall of fame inductees as like favors to the guys that are working right like you yeah. know uh, the rock's mom goes in of course you know and that yeah. makes sense she's she deserves it i'm not questioning that she was a right. promoter in hawaii all that time and stuff right. but you know it's funny i almost feel like maybe thunderbolt was like hey cody pull the string on that one for you know his yeah. dad or something but, but I, mean, I mean not that thunderbolt that, doesn't deserve it you know yeah but, but there's just so many guys that and and like i said it all kind of went together when i said that wrestlemania was damn good and i saw a lot of old school in it that's a that's a throwback to the old school and a and a and a and a a kudos to the old school, you know, maybe not so much a favor for somebody, but just, Hey, who can we look at? Just like, uh, you know, everybody's wanting, um, uh, Bray Wyatt to go in, right? but instead they put his dad and Barry Windham in, which right. makes complete sense. And that's a throwback to old school. And it's also a way of honoring both all three of them. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right, exactly. Even though at first I was like, man, the wrong express went in. They should have put in the Midnight Express. Yeah. I did take that back once I kind of saw the whole story unfold. Yeah. Well, and I mean, dude, yeah. you know, they the meant Midnight something. Midnight Express definitely needs to go in. Right. Uh, but yeah. Maybe they'll do one down south and they can put them in. But it's funny because I was thinking as Paul Heyman did his speech, which, oh, my Lord, you know, he's a great speaker man we know yeah. that that's like saying <laughs> water is good when you're thirsty you know <laughs> but but i was thinking like man you know the only guy that i think can hold a candle to him is cornet you know what i'm saying as far as yeah. a guy that can just rip off and don't he doesn't need a script and anything because you know you could tell some of them were reading the teleprompter and you know right. things like that and that's fine but man paul he he was in he was incredible and then i was just thinking man cornet could do this but you know in that northeast it's like the mason dixon line it's paul Heyman above jim cornet below you know what yeah. i mean and, yeah. But anyway, and I, the fans all. were super disrespectful to Bull. Uh, how you say your last name? Nakano. Bull Nakano. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Man, I thought that was pretty disrespectful. Man, I really did. Yeah. I mean, it was like silly <laughs> chatter, and you couldn't. I I right. really couldn't figure out what she was saying, and it, it made me fast forward because. It was like, right. I can't like this, not because of her, because of them. Yeah. But. Yeah. My, <laughs> you know, that, and, and it is, I mean, that's part of the deal, man. You know, I even noticed that the fans started booing Cody a little during the tag match the night before. And yeah. I was like, oh man, this might go ugly here, but it didn't. But anyway, yeah. yeah. So, so Philly, 
<laughs> yeah, that is <laughs> Philly, really right? I mean, you've been there, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, that's all we got today, Great brother. Great show, man. Uh, Great show. I, I, I'm going to confirm here today. I already got it confirmed, but I'm going to reconfirm. Uh, I'll, I'll give a little tease. This this person uh, is is an ECW original, so we'll see about that next week. So Also, H-O-T-T hot, but we'll go into that <laughs> another day, too. We'll just keep it away. Just keep it away. <laughs> All right, Matt. Well, uh, thanks for listening once again. Uh, thank you, uh, Bunkhouse Bunk, Jimmy Golden. And thank you, Todd Camp, Kayfabe Cave. Thank you for listening. We'll holla at you next week. Wash your ass. And now a word from our sponsor. Saturday, May the 11th, 2024, the biggest pro wrestling event in Columbia, Tennessee's history. Mule Town Mania Fan Fest. Over 50 wrestlers from the past and present going to be there for the meet and greet from 2.30 to 5.30. Also that night, TriStar Wrestling has a huge card already signed. Doors open at 6 for that. Bell time will be 7 p.m. You're not going to want to miss it. A huge card already signed. Also, Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling will be in the house that night doing a Q&A with the Devils, the Wild Boys, and the Mortons from 4.30 to 5.30. Also, you have Cave Babe Cave. They're your toy collectibles and wrestle memorabilia dealers. They're going to be in the house. Also, we've got the Devil's Disciples. Mephisto and Dante will be there. The Wild Boys, Ben Jordan and Steve Neely. The Monster Forsaken. The Fox, Tony Falk and LT Falk. The Morton Brothers, Steve and Shane Morton. The Smoking Buds, Cody and David Morton. Jerry Lynn and Virginia Morton. Hot Rod Biggs. Jeff the Crippler Daniels and Dominique will be there. Debbie Combs, Lady Superstar. Sunny Street will be in the house. Luscious Quentin Charisma. One Half a Booty Call, Brian Turner. Mad Max. Cowboy Billy Montana, Scott Spade and Mistress Misery, Superstar Mikey Dunn, Devious G, Johnny Bandana and Ryder Anderson, The New Era, Tavon Jordan, D'Amico Graves, The One and Only, Majestic, Mr. Entertainment, Yukon Jack, Yours Truly, Pat Dooley, DJ R, Danny Pig, The Voice, Kane D, Pretty Boy, Preston Adams, plus many, many more. The meet and greet will be $15 if you buy your ticket in advance, $20 at the door. TriStar Wrestling that night, $10 if you buy your ticket in advance, $12 if you buy it at the door. This is a huge night, Saturday night, May 11th, 2024, in Columbia, Tennessee, at the National Guard Armory at 844 North Change Campbell Boulevard. It's going to be the place to be for the best wrestling action around. Come and meet some of your local stars, some of your favorite people, some of your least favorite people from your past and present. This is going to be an opportunity that you're not going to want to miss. This is going to be well worth the price of admission alone just for the meet and greet. And then TriStar Wrestling that night. Biggest wrestling event ever signed in Columbia, Tennessee. This is Nick from Crappin's Corner, and I'm here to tell you about an amazing event that's happening on Saturday, April 20th in Orlando. That event is called Glory Days, and it takes place at the Rosen Center, which is right off International Drive. The Rosen Center has an assortment of restaurants, and on April 20th, it will hold dozens of international wrestling stars for what should be an unforgettable day. The lineup includes Ron Simmons, Stan Hansen, Larry Zabisco, Kimberly Page, Matt Riddle, Devon Dudley and many others. One of the featured events at Glory Days is a world-class championship wrestling panel that will feature discussion on the Von Erics, the Iron Claw movie, the Sportorium, and so much more by the people that lived it, including the one-man gang, Al Perez, Missy Hyatt, and more. Tickets are available now, and they are as low as $30. Head on over to Eventbrite and type in Glory Days. Hope to see everyone in Orlando for Glory Days on April 20th. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling. The podcast that's based on the old school, but can still help you find the good stuff from today. Jimmy Street and the Plastic Sheik, Jared, are the undisputed tag team champions of the wrestling podcast world. 
From thought-provoking topics to superstar interviews to action figure expertise. This team does it all. And all they ask is, give me back my pro wrestling. Every other Thursday, wherever you listen to podcasts. Join me, Gene Jackson, for the Jackson Interaction Podcast, where I'll be doing one-on-one interviews with people from the world of professional wrestling, as well as stand-up comedy. You can get them anywhere podcasts are available in both video and audio form, but you can find them all at GeneJacksonPod.com. That's right, it's the talk of Middle Tennessee, the channel you love to hate and the channel you hate to love. It's Brian Turner from Brian Turner's VHS Rehab. And if you're looking for matches from Wolfie D to Jerry Lawler to Dusty Rhodes and the team that put a pimp before your eyes and a goatee between your thighs, Booty Call and Athena, go to LostWrestling.com. See, I made it easy for you. Brian Turner's VHS Rehab. Booyah! So that was another great episode. Hey, Wolfie, tell them where they can find you on social media. Jimmy, they can find me in the club, bottle full of bub. I'm just kidding. Uh, they can find me on Facebook. Uh, my personal page is Warren Wolf, W-O-L-F-E. I'm on Instagram, at Warren Wolf 13. You can always find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, at Live Wolfie D. Here's the thing. Wolfie always has offers for his autographed photos. He has a selection of some awesome photos from throughout his career that he will autograph and personalize any way that you want him to. Just contact him either directly at his personal Facebook page or through any one of our other pages, and we'll make sure you get in contact directly with Wolfie. Get those photos, right, Wolfie? Yeah, I've got some good stuff on there, you know, to help with the podcast. Folks, if you can't get out to a show to meet Wolfie D, there's nothing like that, especially for the fans of PG-13 and Wolfie D. And before we go, you can always find me, your host, Jimmy Street, at James Rock Street on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And hey, Jimmy, before we go real quick, I just want to add in there, uh, from the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate First of all, the work you've done for this podcast. You have worked your butt off. Secondly, the people that are liking the page. Beyond that, even more, is the people that are listening. And we really appreciate that. Yeah, and remember, guys, the podcast drops a new episode every Monday at noon. And our past episodes are streaming now on demand on all major podcast formats. Thanks again. I got a cat for you, don't. He got a cat for you, don't. I got a cat for you, don't. He got a cat for you, don't. He got a cat for you, don't. And here we go. The original white boy that came out sagging, not bragging, don't be hating, cause you're spitting the truth. Still loving in color. Don't rush your mother. Utilize a hubcap. I like any other. Back in the day, I was NOD, and I was P to the G plus the one and the three. In case you forgot, they call me Wolfie D. Been cloned and copied so many times. Tired of suckers taking credit for what is mine. You know who you are without me name dropping wrestling's first white boy coming out hip hop. Been doing it like this since 92. Lay low for a while when you thought I was through. Listen real close to these rhymes that I've injected. This shit's so sick it makes your ears get infected. Mad skills, no faking, there is no one great. Cause I'm bringing more folks from over one for later. Not here to play games, so you better be aware. You don't like me, so what? I really don't care. Like the time I keep ticking and I can't be stopped. You suck a step to the side unless you want to get dropped. When my finish, I'll straight knock you out. Please allow me to tell you what it's all about. Gonna wind it up. And I'm driving it home, it's Wolfie D, baby Huh, I got a cap for your dome I got a cap for your dome We got a cap for your dome We got a cap for your dome This has been a James Rock Street production